So our Blessed Mother has received rights and authority over souls because she's so submitted to the will of God. It makes her the point of reference for other souls to become um, submitted to God's will. So Our Lady is Queen of Heaven and Earth by grace. Uh, just as our Lord is King of Heaven and Earth, by nature and by conquest. That's a, sort of a big, con a big concept. Uh, our Lord is um, Christ the King because, first of all, he's the Son of God, so that means he's the creator also. All of, all of uh, nature owes its obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ because he's the Son of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ is also King because his human nature is united, united to his divine nature, that means that uh, he is the greatest human being there possibly could be. That, that makes all of uh, creation subject to him. And finally, our Lord is king because he won, W-O-N, he won nature by his conquest on the cross. Those are the three, re three reasons why he's king. Because he's son of God, because his divine nature anoints his human nature, and finally because he won all of the battle for human nature on the cross. So that's how he is king, by nature and conquest. Our Lady is queen by grace, uh, meaning that she has a title to be obeyed by all of us because with her, the whole life of grace began in this world. However, as the kingdom of Jesus exists primarily in the interior of a man because God because he has said the kingdom of God is within you this means that the kingdom of the Blessed Virgin Mary is also principally interior and that is her kingdom is in the soul so our Lord is king by conquest but is you know the kingdom is kingdom of God is within you so he's primarily the king of our heart so the Blessed Virgin Mary, similarly, she's the, she's the Queen of Grace, so her kingdom is principally in our heart as well. For this reason, we can call her the Queen of all hearts, just as our, as our Lord is called King of the hearts. So uh, that's a very important concept. She principally is Queen in this way, Queen by Grace. And our Lord is principally King by a King in the interior kingdom. But be careful with this kind of... Um, you know, talk, this kind of uh, reference to our Lord. Some might limit his kingship and say, well, then he's just king of people's interior life, life's lives, which is already big, but he's not king of the outside. And that's a problem. And I think our, our Catholic Church has been thinking like that for too long now, 60 years at least, uh, trying to downplay and diminish our Lord's human reign over the world. And uh, some, of the first, um, uh, some of the first efforts we saw in that direction, which are not good efforts, is back in the rule of uh, Pope Pius IX the, the in the 19th century in Rome. They took away his, 
pontifical states, they being whatever, the kingdom of Italy and the Freemasons at that time, they took away his rule of different places, which was showed that uh, the Pope was a prince of this world as well as the prince of the church. And that was an important position because that showed that our Lord does not only rule on the inside, it shows that our, our Lord rules on the outside. But by taking those papal, what they call the papal states or pontifical states, away from him, they left the Pope just as a ruler of the in interior, showing that Christ should not have any kind of rule in politics, governments, anything on the outside. And that was unfortunate. You may know that uh, Pope Pius IX, uh, he had himself buried. That sounds funny. Usually when you're dead, you can't have yourself buried anywhere. But it was in his will and testament. Please bury me, bury me in the church of uh, St. Lawrence outside the walls. Uh, you know, there's seven basilicas in Rome, and uh, four of them are inside the wall walls and three of them are outside, St. Paul, St. Lawrence, and St. Sebastian, I think. Uh, they're outside the walls of the original Rome, the smaller Rome. And uh, he said, please bury me there because that place supposedly uh, does not belong to the church anymore because it got usurped by the Masonic government of this world. Therefore, by burying me there, that will be a statement to say that, no, this still belongs to the Pope. So that's how, how you have this unusual phenomenon of Pope Pius IX being buried in a church far away, kind of far away from St. Peter's uh, between the bodies of St. Lawrence and St. Stephen in that, in that basilica. Uh, and that was a very important thing. They, they kind of had to do it secretively so that the Masons didn't catch up with them and, and, um, and uh, hijack the event of moving the Pope's body from inside of Rome to outside of Rome on whatever morning that was in the 19th century. All that to explain that Our Lady is principally the queen of the inside of our soul. But don't think that just because of that, she's not supposed to rule on the outside also. Same thing with our Lord. He's principally the king of the interior of man. The kingdom of God is within you. But don't think that because of that, he doesn't have a right in the political authority of all lands. Because he's king by being son of God, He's king by the divine nature, uh, anointing his human nature, and he's king because he won the greatest victory ever on the cross. So that's, um, uh, we're talking about consequences of uh, the Holy Ghost doing great wonders with Our Lady in souls. So the uh, first consequence is that Our Lady is queen by grace, just as our Lord is king by nature and conquest. Secondly, uh, we conclude that devotion to our Blessed Mother is higher than devotion to any of the other saints. You've probably heard this um, distinction before from your catechism class that our Lord receives the highest veneration possible. And it's not just veneration, it's actually adoration. Only our Lord who is God, receives adoration. And that's called, with a nice Latin term, that's called latria, latria. I think we're most familiar with hearing kind of a derivative of this word. When somebody worships false gods, which is a sin, that's called idolatry. In Latin, idolatria, which none of us should do. But at least it gives us an idea of this word latria. It's adoration. We adore God. That's the only one we adore. That's he himself, and him alone shall you serve. But um, the mother of God, who is not God, uh, she uh, deserves the highest type of veneration possible, or the highest type of reverence possible, and that's called hyperdulia, or some say dulia, hyperdulia. I say hyperdulia. The greatest type of veneration possible, oh, and that is exclusive to her. That is exclusive to the mother of God. It's not adoration as we give to God, but it's the highest veneration possible, meaning you could put all the rest of the saints together and give them the veneration which is due to them, and it still would not add up to the amount of veneration that we uh, that is due to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And why would that be? Because she's the tabernacle of the Most High, 
as we say in the Litany of Loreto, only she has carried the Son of God within, within her body. Only she is the dwelling place of God. In a certain way, she's a dwelling place of all heaven because of what she did. She deserves what we call hyperdulia, the greatest type of reverence, reverence possible to any saint, but all the saints put together. And finally, we end up with the type of veneration for all the rest of the saints. I would have said just the normal saints or any other kind of saint, but that's not quite fair to say. Because anyone who's been canonized, or anyone who is a saint, has practiced heroic virtue. That's the definition of a saint. Someone who has practiced heroic virtue in this life, and therefore we are sure that they're in the beatific vision in the next life. And they receive what's called dulia. Not hyperdulia, but dulia. Now between the two, dulia and hyperdulia, which the, the Blessed Virgin Mary receives, there is a great difference. Uh, because in general, and I, I don't mean to downplay, this, downplay the saints at all, but uh, in general, to the saints, you have what's called a devotion, uh, which is motivated by piety, and it's particular, and it's, it can even be a little bit arbitrary or contingent. I have a hard time putting, uh, what's his name, St. Joseph in that category because he seems like a necessary part of our redemption as well. If you didn't have someone protecting the mother of God, if you didn't have someone teaching the son of God how to use the tools in the carpentry shop, if you not, didn't, have, didn't have someone giving this great human example of how a man should behave, I have a hard time how, understanding how the Son of God would have uh, increased in wisdom and knowledge and grace before God and man, as we read in the Holy Scripture. I have a hard time picturing that. St. Joseph was largely there for all that. You got to say, let's say, essentially there for all of that. And so um, I, I have a hard time putting him in a category of a devotion like you would just give to all the other saints. St. Joseph is still a little bit exceptional. But after that, you know, we have giants. There was St. Paul and St. Peter and St. Mary Magdalene and St. John. These are real giants of the Catholic faith. But they still receive what's called a dulia. You could have a nice private devotion to St. John or to St. Paul or to St. Mary Magdalene or to your own pat patron saint. That's magnificent. <clears throat> but it will still only qualify as a particular devotion to a particular saint. But when we, come, when we come to the Mother of God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, we have there the reason for which and by which all other saints became saints. For the reason we're saying, if our Lord is king by nature and conquest, our Lady is queen by grace. Uh, meaning the Blessed Virgin Mary is the first human being that cooperated with grace so much that she became deserving of receiving the incarnation. That's huge. And, and God will always work through those channels. You know, if he's going to touch human nature with his grace, he's going to touch human nature with the highest member of the human nature, and that's the Blessed Virgin Mary. So Blessed Virgin, the grace starts with her. Of course, as a result of that, the Son of God comes into the world, and he will give his grace to souls only through the Blessed Mother as he himself came into this world, only through the Blessed Mother. So... When we're talking about the mother of God, we're not just talking about a devotion. We're talking about a, a central, essential, um, indis indispensable source of grace by which all the other saints are made into saints. So, you know, queen of all martyrs and queen of all saints. And, uh, none of them would be what they are or what they were without the Blessed Virgin Mary having uh, merited so much grace first. And then all of us merit grace in her. So devotion to Our Lady, Lady is higher than devotion to all the other saints. That's the second consequence of the Holy Ghost working in this world through the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Blessed Virgin, or as we say here, Mother Mary, is all the more necessary for men to attain their final end. Consequently, we must not place devotion to her on the same level 
as devotion to the other saints. The Blessed Virgin Mary is necessary to God by a necessity which is what we call hypothetical, meaning that God chose to use the Blessed Virgin Mary, but she be, still became a necessity because there's no other way for Jesus to become a man but to be, to be the son of a human mother. So she's necessary in that way, and for that reason, she is above all the other saints. And um, we may not place devotion to her on the same level as the other saints. You might have noticed, and I've probably talked about this before, it's quite common that in the sanctuary, you have two images of saints on either side of the altar. And they're usually the highest saints possible. Our Lord, usually the Sacred Heart, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and St. Joseph. And uh, it's rare, for me, it's rare that I've seen like a statue of St. Michael or someone else. But usually you have these two saints, two statues on either side of the altar. Uh, and we don't have St. Joseph there. In this church, we have St. Joseph over his own, his own side altar on the epistle side there. But let's imagine that we didn't have the image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. That's, that's done in some churches. Just by having our Lord present in the tabernacle, we don't need his image of the Sacred Heart. So you end up with the statue of St. Joseph, the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Well, in that case, the Blessed Mother, her image will go to the side of the Gospel, and St. Joseph's image will go to the side of the Epistle, because the side of the Gospel is higher than the side of the Epistle. In this present formation, we have a Sacred Heart on the Gospel side, and Our Lady on the Epistle side. Or as the crucifix faces you from the altar, the Sacred Heart is on the right-hand side for him, and the Blessed Mother is on the left-hand side for him. I tell you this because it is rare that you will ever find a church without an image of the Mother of God in the sanctuary. You may find a church without, without the statue of St. Joseph, but you never find a church without the image of Our Lady. She'll either be on the Epistle side or the Gospel side. It's just the mind of the church to show us that all of His grace, which we're receiving from the altar during the Mass and through the sacraments, is coming to us through the Blessed Virgin Mary. For that reason, we must have her image in the church. When we have a baptism of a child, more than an adult, but we have a baptism, we finish the baptism, first thing we do is go over to the side of the church where our Blessed Mother is, and we consecrate that child to the Blessed Virgin Mary immediately. Because we all understand that no grace is going to get into a soul unless it comes through the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is not an ordinary saint. Sorry for that, using that unusual, that's not a very good expression because no saints are ordinary. But this is not like all the other saints. Our Lady is the source of grace through which all grace comes into this world. And we're not going to get grace without her. That's why her image is always in the front of the church. There's... Uh, this is from the Jesuit priest Suarez. I suppose he was in the 17th century, but I could be wrong on that. He says that there's no one in heaven without the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, meaning, you know, there's probably millions and millions of people in heaven. That's magnificent. The way our Lord, the way our Lord says it in the Apocalypse is that there is an innumerable amount of saints in heaven. Then he goes through, he enumerates or lists all the tribes of Israel, and Dan and Beersabe and uh, Manassas and Joseph and I don't know who all. Each one has 12,000 represented, coming to a total of 144,000. But those are symbolic numbers to mean the biggest number of possible, the biggest number of possible, etc. of these saints. So there's a lot of people in heaven, a lot of souls in heaven, I would guess that most of them have been Christians who have understood that our Lord Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. They have been baptized. They have received the sacraments. They have the life of grace. They have assisted at Mass, I think, unless I'm living in a sort of a la-la land, false idealistic world that I invented. I would guess that's the, the majority of the saints in heaven are the people that we know from the last 2,000 years who have 
followed the way, the truth, and the life which, with the religion that he has instituted. There may be some exceptions. And of course, there are all the people from the Old Testament, the 4,000 years before our Lord Jesus Christ. There were some holy people back then, too, who didn't know all the catechism that we know. But they lived in our Lord Jesus Christ in as much as they expected the redemption to come and hoped for it to come. Uh, so uh, those are the souls in heaven. Now, any soul in heaven knows that it's there because the Blessed Virgin Mary has made intercession for that soul. Usually, like us right now, we know how important the Blessed Mother is. We're praying our rosary. We're having her statue in front of the church. Every time we go to make a prayer or ask for grace or something like that, we always ask, of it, ask it through the hands of our Blessed Mother. We understand these things. And hopefully we'll go to heaven someday and we'll continue to sing the praises of God and also give great veneration to the greatest creature in heaven, who is the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, but there may be some souls in heaven, and this actually comes from St. Louis de Montfort more than Suarez, who I'm quoting at this time. There may be some souls in heaven who did not recognize the Blessed Virgin Mary during their life. And they would have accidentally got into heaven. Now, even if they only accidentally got into heaven without knowing the Mother of God, now that they are in heaven, they know the Mother of God, and they know how important she is, because she's the one who, through her intercession, got them into heaven. That's a, that's a um, position, that's a thesis, something like that, of St. Louis de Montfort, that no one, is in he no one who is in heaven uh, does not recognize the Blessed Virgin Mary. They all recognize her, whether they knew her or not in this life. So Suarez says that it has pro been proved, uh, proven that devotion to our Blessed Lady is necessary to attain salvation. Despite what I just said from St. Louis de Montfort. But Suarez says that he cannot conceive of people going to heaven without having devotion to our Blessed Mother. And he quotes, his, it's from St. Augustine, St. Ephraim, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, uh, St. Germanus, all kinds of uh, church fathers and church doctors say the same thing. And then, um, if someone does not have great devotion to Our Lady, it is a sure sign of God's disapproval. Uh, so, we must have devotion to Our Lady so that we can get to heaven. If there are souls in heaven who didn't recognize Our Lady in this life, they certainly recognize her now. Uh, in, uh, if we're talk to talk negatively, even the devil and his followers, forced by the evidence of the truth, have been frequently obliged against their own will to admit how important is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And um, I'll tell a story in relation to that. This is in the Chronicles of St. Dominic. Uh, St. Dominic, if I'm not mistaken, was uh, came to, during the end of the Middle Ages, it's about the, the year 1100 and something. And he was dealing with a heresy at that time, even before the famous heretics of the Protestant Revolution of the 1500s and following. There was a heresy in France called uh, Waldensianism. And it probably had several different facets, but one of the big ones is that same old thing that comes up all the time. Whatever belongs to matter is evil, and whatever belongs to spirit is good. So if you're praying, be sure that that's gonna help your soul. If you're sinning because of some physical defect or physical weakness, don't worry about it. You're just corrupt flesh anyway. You can't do anything about it. it sounds so humble, you know. It's like, we're such corrupt beings. There's nothing I can do to save myself. No, no, it's not humble. It's a big cop-out, escape. You know, if you just keep saying, well, whatever is of the flesh is bad, and you commit some sort of sin, you say, well, couldn't help it. 
um, that's that's the uh, cop out, uh, the cowardice, and the escape of this kind of heresy. Anyway, that was Waldensianism, and you might think, well, that's not such a big deal. I mean, okay, that's the way a guy believes. That's not going to have any influence on me. Well, back in those days, you know, Middle Ages and even after, um, you know, the Christianity had such a um, an influence and was so important in any kind of society where it was that people who started preaching against it in any way with some sort of heresy usually tried to gain uh, some sort of political power at the same time. And you get this thing where you have city against city and then little wars going on between different cities of a Catholic country uh, because one side of the, one city believes this way and another city believes that way. And it was all very much connect, connected with the economy and politics. So you may think, okay, that's a weirdo who believes that, you know, everything to do with spirit is good and everything to do with matter is bad. Well, we'll just make sure he stays in his own house and doesn't bother us. Well, no, back then everything became very political and then, uh, you know, what you believe kind of had something to do with how much power you had in this world and therefore you end up with things like murders happening and raids and people being killed and martyred because they weren't part of the Waldensians and you think, this is kind of weird. And you think this is, maybe in the Roman Empire they killed people for being Christians. I understand that. But now we got different versions of Christians, and one of them are heretics, and they're killing the Christians. How, where did that come from? Well, for the reasons I just said. So to give you a little background on how this story is connected, uh, in the Chronicles of St. Dominic. So near Carcassonne, that's in the south part of France, and very touristy now, oh boy. Uh, near Carcassonne, where St. Dominic, was preaching the rosary. That was the main way that he overcame the heretics. Uh, there was an unfortunate heretic who was possessed by a multitude of devils. These evil spirit, spirits, to their confusion, were compelled at the command of Our Lady to confess many great and consoling truths concerning devotion to her. This they did so clearly and forcibly that however weak our devotion to Our Lady may be, we cannot read this authentic story containing such an unwilling tribute paid by the devils to devotion to Our Lady without shedding tears of joy. So I wish we had a little testimony of what they were actually saying. But uh, you know how when we celebrate the feast of um, the holy name of Jesus, we have that quote from St. Paul that says, all powers in heaven, on earth, and under the earth uh, must uh, shall, shall worship his name, shall give praise to his name. That's the feast of the uh, holy name of Jesus. Great, and that's true. And you think, well, why is it that the powers under the earth have to give reverence to the name of Jesus? And the answer is, he created them. God created them. They fell, but still, they fell, but still they owe reverence to God. In one way or another, I'm not exactly sure how they do it, but they're subject to God, the devils. Well, we just said about what our Lord has by, by nature and conquest, Our Lady has by grace. So these souls in hell are obliged to give reverence to the Mother of God also, or at least like on this occasion, to forcibly admit uh, what, just a moment, great, con great consoling truths about her, about her influence on souls, about the conversion of souls that happen because of her, about the absence of certain devils because of her, you know, Our Lady does that. Uh, and even the devils have to admit it when they're obliged to by her. We don't normally think of her as being like um, the master or mistress of the underworld, but it would stand to reason. If she's a queen of heaven and earth by grace, hell somehow, somehow fits in there, and she will uh, show her domination over the uh, angels, fallen angels in hell too. I do not believe that anyone who anyone can acquire intimate union with our Lord and perfect fidelity to the Holy Spirit without a very close union with the Most Blessed Virgin Mary and an, and an absolute dependence on her support. You know, it is a dogma of the Church that there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church. You must receive sacraments, you must receive grace, in order to be sanctified and therefore go to heaven. 
That's pretty simple for us to get that into our mind. Next, if we're going to know God the Father, we must know God the Son. He himself said so. No one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom he chooses to reveal him. And then our Lord told the Pharisees, at least on one occasion, probably on several, he said, you all say that you are sons of God and you worship God. And he says, you do not worship God. You do not recognize God because you do not recognize me. Therefore, you're liars. So we have this idea, no salvation without the means of grace that God has left us, our Lord Jesus Christ has left us. We will not know God unless we know God the Son. And then we have this other part, which we understand through the centuries of the Catholic Church, which is you can't really know the Son unless you know the Blessed Virgin Mary. Because if she's the one handing out the graces, which are the results of all the fruits and merits that our Lord won for us on the cross, then if we don't know her, we're not going to receive the fruits and merits which are necessary to know God, or even necessary to know our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. You know, no salvation outside the Catholic Church. Got it. You don't know God unless you know our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Got it. You don't know the Church, you don't know the Son of God, unless you know the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's not in the Bible, but it just comes to us from years and years of Catholic thinking. All the grace that our Lord has won for us comes to us through his mother. This gift of faith and the gift of recognizing God, even recognizing the Son of God, must come from the same source, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So they're strong, they're strong truths, you know. If I say to anyone nowadays, you know, there's no salvation outside the Catholic Church, they might listen to it for a second they might say, well, that's good. I, I'm glad you believe firmly in what you're doing. Some might get offended and say, hey, wait a second. Just because you're, you're Catholic doesn't mean you can be telling me who am not Catholic that I can't go to heaven because I'm not a Catholic. I know it sounds kind of severe. And if I were a great theologian, I might explain to you how sometimes possibly even though people who aren't part of the Catholic Church might get saved without knowing that they're actually doing things that belong to the Catholic Church. And that will require a long discussion. But we still have to re come to the same principle that if it weren't for the Catholic Church, they wouldn't be receiving those graces. So, no salvation outside the Catholic Church. Now, that's not the topic of our, our conference for tonight, but that's a big one. So, no salvation outside the Catholic Church. And then, uh, you don't know God the Father unless you know God the Son. That's huge. And then... You don't know the Son of God unless you know the Blessed Virgin Mary because she's the one that gives out, gives out all the graces which our Lord has won for us. And that's just as big, in my opinion. No, so, uh, Sorry, uh, you don't know the Son of God unless you have the Blessed Virgin Mary. That seems to me just as big as no salvation outside the Catholic Church. You can't get to our Lord Jesus Christ unless you have the Blessed Virgin Mary giving you the grace to get to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how big she is. That's how important she is. I do not believe that anyone can acquire intimate union with our Lord without a very close union with the Most Blessed Virgin Mary and an absolute dependence on her support. Um, so there it is. That's for all Catholics. That's for everyone that really wants to get to heaven. They're going to know our Blessed Mother in order to know our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a little bit on a different level, but there's some similar words used here, which is, um, which are, this is particularly for priests. Uh, all priests must have a great devotion to the Mother of God, or all priests must have a Marian life. And that, that makes sense because uh, priests are other Christs, as our Lord Jesus Christ had a very strong affinity to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that's what constantly gave more and more grace to his own life, priests must have a very strong affinity to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and that gives grace to their life. Now we think of our Lord in his human nature. He learned from the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he increased in wisdom and age and grace before God and men because he was at the feet of the Blessed Mother while he was growing up. So priests can learn from her too. Just as our Lord 
learn from him, learn from her. Our Lady alone found grace before God without the help of any other creature. All those who have since found grace before God have found it only through her. Uh, so, you know, Our Lady lived at a time when people were waiting for the Messiah to come, but uh, the life of grace was not in the world yet. Um, there was no Mass. There were no sacraments yet. Uh, Our Lady lived during a time that was kind of godless. Uh, she found grace before God at that time. How? By renouncing herself so much and by uh, looking forward to the redemption. I've probably told this, told this to you before, but it's a great little meditation for me. And it comes from St. Elizabeth of Hungary. Uh, the Blessed Mother grew up in the temple. We know that her parents, St. Joachim and St. Anne, dedicated Our Lady to the temple already at the age of three. It's not in the Bible, but it's true. And uh, she grew up there until the age of 15. The prophecies are what they are. The people, the priests at that time knew that any time now, the Son of God would be coming into this world. And somehow they even knew further than that, this is where the private re revelation of St. Elizabeth of Hungary would be the source, but uh, hopefully it's the true source. Uh, she says that the, ch the girls, the children, would have known at that time that it's possible that any one of us could be the mother of the Redeemer. So Our Lady saw in that um, kind of a warning light going off. Hey, wait a second. If someone can become the mother of the Redeemer, that person would probably become kind of proud or very proud. And therefore, in order that I do not have this great temptation against humility, uh, I will make a vow of virginity to make sure I'm not chosen for such a great calling. And it was under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost that she did that. You know, this is our Blessed Mother kind of stripping herself of herself in order that God can completely fill her. Self-renunciation so that God can work out his will in, in her. She found grace before God without the help of any other creature. Maybe she found help from God, but not any other creature. She renounced herself so that the kingdom of God can live, could live in her, and because of that, she became the mother of God. So, uh, and then the other part about how she finally conceived is the other mystery of the um, incarnation, but I'm sure you all know that story well already. But, though, but all those who have since found grace before God, have found it through the Blessed Virgin Mary. She was the only one who found grace before God uh, without other creatures having grace. Now that she has come into the world, all of us find God, the grace of God, through her because she is a creature with grace. The Blessed Virgin Mary intercedes for us in heaven so that we may receive grace. But she received or receives grace on her own without any other creatures having it. It's almost as if we could say that the life of grace has Our Lady for its point of reference. Now, things begin with her. She's the point of reference by which the life of grace begins. All right, so I gave you a lot of lofty principles about our Blessed Mother. Therefore, I'd like to move on to some... Um, what would you call this? Uh, some material, physical, nuts and bolts uh, sort of life, which is the story of our hero, uh, Father Maximilian Kolbe, who is all about um, the um, true devotion to Our Lady. So uh, last week when we concluded, we were saying that, um, uh, how did that go? He was working in Grodno, he was recalled to the sanatorium, the TB, the TB san, again. And there he was kind of languishing. Uh, but work was still going on well at Grodno. Uh, there were more rooms for management, more brothers needed to operate the machines. It was a community within a community. By 1926, they were at 45,000 copies of the uh, Night of the Immaculata per year. 
but he was called to the sanatorium to do another kind of uh, prayer, which is kind of the prayer of humility, while all of this was going on back at the um, friary. And uh, he received some unfortunate news from his brother, Father Alphonse, that the priests at Gradno are quite happy with the work of the Immaculata, because they noticed that by selling all these publications, and probably by that time books and so forth, that there was a good profit coming to the Franciscan monastery, and therefore the brothers could live comfortably. Uh, Father Maximilian was um, really disturbed by that, disheartened, um, probably, um, and he had just uh, indignation. He was angry about that, and he said, far be it from us. He said, he, uh, he added that the curse of St. Francis would certainly f fall upon all their work. I didn't know that saints, saints carried curses. I know saints carry blessings, but... According to him, the curse of St. Francis would fall upon all their work if this work was used as a means to assure to the religious an easy life. So um, he doesn't, he's not very, he was not happy about that. He was angry about that. Well, eventually he came out of the sanatorium again. So that was the second time in his life, at least second time. We know of him being in the TB tuberculosis sanatorium. And now we start our next chapter, which is called The City of the Immaculata. And if I wanted to show off for you, I would show that I can pronounce this in Polish. But none, none of it makes anything, any sense to me. Niepokolanov. The first time I heard that word was at least 20 years ago when Father Stellan was preaching about these things at our retreat. And I didn't remember too much from the retreat, but I do remember how well he pronounced the word. Niepokolanov. Polish for City of the Immaculata. So it soon became obvious that the press, you know, printing press at Gradno could not remain there because um, the community, again, you know, just like happened in, in, in Krakow the first time, here's the religious community, here's the printing community, these two organizations can't get along in the same house, there's conflict of interest. And because the city, um, let's see, the city of Gradno was too far out of the way to reach 60,000 readers regularly. That's what they were up to now, was the publication had to get to everyone, 60,000 60, people every month. It used to be 45,000 people in one year, but now it's 60,000 people in one month. You know, kind of a reflection on this. Um, we're talking about the years 1920, even in the early 1930s. Uh, you probably know that things were heating up at that time for um, another world war. And it's almost, you can study the work of the Immaculata and, as, and also the, as the world gets closer and closer to that big war, you can sort of see that uh, Our Lady is making one last uh, huge plea to sinners, Christians, Catholics. Come back once again before your whole world is destroyed from war. And a lot of people came back. And they probably sanctified themselves a lot during the war because of this kind of work of St. Maximilian Kolbe before the war. So uh, they, had to, they had to get to 60,000 readers regularly. So he found, St. Maximilian found a new location 26 miles away from Warsaw. This was a piece of land owned by a prince. A uh, prince for us modern people makes us think, well, Poland must be a big land and the prince of Poland must be the man that's in line to have the throne as the next king. I don't think it's that simple. There's probably duchies and counts, counties and all kinds of different uh, monarchical administrations where there are probably a lot of princes. So this particular piece of land was owned by a prince. So Father Maximilian <laughs> went to go talk to this prince to see if he could buy his land. And first, he, Father Maximilian placed a statue of Our Lady on the property and went to approach the prince to ask for a price. Uh, the prince gave an agreeable price, and St. Maximilian went back to his father provincial and said, um, can we buy this land near Warsaw? Here's the price. We can continue with our project there without any uh, conflict of interest and close enough to a, the capital city in order to get the information out to souls. The father provincial did not like the price, did not like the land, and said no. 
So therefore, Father Maximilian went back to the prince to say, sorry, it would have been great, but it's not possible. And the prince said, then what am I supposed to do with that statue that you placed on my property? <laughs> it's only about that big, you know. <laughs> he's got the land, he's a prince, and he says the biggest problem is, well, what are you going to do about that statue? Or what, <laughs> what's going to happen to that statue? And Father Maximilian said, well, just leave the statue where it is. And the prince said, well, then take the land too. I'm giving to you, I'm giving to you for nothing. So we know who bought that land for, for, the, for Father Maximilian it was the Immaculata. So uh, the Franciscans, poor men, they, they were, uh, back in those times, in you know, the 1920s, so those were tough people, tough Polish people. They started very primitive there. So they had several buildings that they sort of slapped up, or what do we call that? Uh, they slapped up several buildings to put a little chapel, to put some sort of sleeping quarters for the brothers, some sort of shops, you know, to put the printing press and so forth. A lot of the buildings did not have roofs on them yet. I have a hard time picturing that, but there it is. And a lot of the brothers sleeping in these buildings had no roof overhead, over their head, even while it was snowing. So they were sleeping out under the stars with snow going on. There were no tables to eat on. They were eating while sitting on the dirt floor in these different buildings that they slapped up. Well, by November of 1927, um, this is just one year later, the, pl the place was ready to receive the machinery. On December the 7th, 1927, the eve of the Inception, Immaculate Inception is on December the 8th, uh, on the eve of the Immaculate Inception, this whole land was called the City of the Immaculate. Over the next 10 years, it would grow with all the things necessary to evangelize the world. They had sleeping quarters, print shops, a chapel, a hospital, a radio station, and even an airport. And the community grew in proportion to all these things. So from 1927 to 1938, it was growing with all the things I just told you. It became the world's largest religious community. Uh, that's huge. That's huge. I like to brag, or we like to brag, about Archbishop Lefebvre. In the 1960s, he was in charge of the Holy Ghost Fathers. That was the largest mission uh, congregation in the world. It had 5,000 priests. Archbishop Lefebvre was in charge of all of that. That's great. He was in charge of it for six years. So we're kind of close to Archbishop Lefebvre, and we're proud of that in a good way. Uh, well, Father Maximilian, back in 1938, was in charge of the world's largest religious community. So you need to take Franciscans, Benedictines, uh, uh, Dominicans, Jesuits, uh, with, and they were in, you know, just those religious orders, religious orders existed for centuries. And you say, here's a group of the Franciscans called the City of the Immaculate. They have, I didn't give you the numbers yet, I will give you those numbers. They had the world's largest community. This was, and you know, just in one, not spread across the world, but in just one place, they had 800 Franciscans. That was 13 priests. That's not that many, actually, for priests. 13 priests, 140 what they call scholastics, kind of like seminarians, 609 lay brothers, all of them specialists in their own field. This made 800 people in the community. And while all this great Christian growth was going on, the world was on the brink of war, 1938. In the year 1939, the publication turned out one million copies per month of the night of the Immaculata. It's a, you know, it's a magazine. So, you know, that all started in 19, um, I think you said 1922, something like that, 1926. Uh, Father Maximilian had to move to Warsaw. 1939, he's had one million copies per month. Um, now, this is not all about numbers and physical increase and material. Sooner or later, there's a paragraph in there about spiritual growth. I don't want to talk all night, but I'll, I'll try to get to that fast. Uh, there were many sub, many sub publications besides the Night of the Immaculata. They had something for children. They had something for priests. They had something for um, catechists, 
all getting their different um, publications. There were many languages for each title, and there were also other religious goods being sold and sent out to souls. Uh, the community had all the craftsmen and professionals necessary to be self-sufficient. This is all to the honor of the Immaculata, directed by a feeble-bodied priest who was usually suffering from tuberculosis. Father Maximilian's idea was to sanctify all technology by using it in the service of the Immaculata. Back in his seminary days of Rome, there was a professor who challenged Father Maximilian, or maybe the other way around. They were speaking about the movie industry in the 19-teens, early 1920s. Uh, the professor from Rome said, this is obviously a tool of the devil because so many souls are um, thinking about worldly things because of watching movies. And on the contrary, Father Maximilian said, no, we just got to make some Catholic movies and get souls to be sanctified by using these things. In that same spirit, uh, once he had a visiting a big shot priest to the city of the Immaculate, and uh, this, this, he was a canon, this big shot priest, he said, you've got all the latest you know, printing presses and latest technology here. That's so worldly. Uh, you're supposed to be a Franciscan. What do you think would happen if St. Francis himself visited the city of the Immaculata and saw all this worldliness here? And Father Maximilian said, I think he would roll up his sleeves and get to learn how to use one of these machines like all of us should. <laughs> to get the word out there of the true Catholic faith through the Immaculata. All right. However, or nevertheless, Father Maximilian did not become an activist despite all of this human work going on. Someone once asked him, in what does the true progress of the City of the Immaculate consist? He answered, all the machines or publications in the world would not define our true progress. No, progress is spiritual. Even if we had to suspend our work, and all of this is going to come true in a matter of, from 1939, I think by 1941 it was all finished. We'll find out. Even if we had to suspend our work, even if all the members of the militia abandoned us, even if we had to disperse as the leaves swept by the autumn winds, if in our souls the ideal of ne Neapokalana continued to grow, we could well say, my little children, that we were in full progress. If you're convinced on the inside that Our Lady is the one who builds up the life of, life of Christ in souls, with all that that involves, you've got the city of the Immaculate within you, and that's bigger than all of the human progress, all of the, these uh, material machines and techniques that we have here in front of us. Very good. I have a couple more paragraphs, but I, th I think I'll leave it at that tonight because that's really a... Um, substantial thought you know maybe we're not witnessing all the great physical work of father maximilian right now ourselves either but if we have that vision that our lady must rule all souls by putting the life of christ in those souls then we have the essential so we'll say our prayer Thank you. 